Good afternoon, evening. What time you're tuning in the program called What's Going On on FlintTalkRadio.com. I'm George Moss, the host of the program, and we are very delighted to have you with us this afternoon. We have a lot of things to talk about today, given what is happening in Washington. Is anybody surprised about the fact that we need to hide our children <laughs> from the politicians? <laughs> I mean, they've already stolen all of their money. And we are looking to see what else we have to keep them from trying to steal between now and uh, July, uh, 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 not July, but November of 2014, because we're going to have to turn some of these people out and get back some of the control that's invested by this document right here. It's called the Constitution that was, in fact, endowed uh, by the framers to those of us who are their posterity. And I want to know if the people in Washington understand what this document really is about here because <clears throat> all it really does is uh, chain or at least drive the chain government down to uh, make sure that we did not have the calamity that we have on our hands right now by the politicians in Washington. <clears throat> and we've got to get a grip. I don't know uh, exactly when the murrins of this um, republic began to come unglued, but in Article 4, Section 4, it says that every state is guaranteed a Republican form of government. <clears throat> and I think in order to guarantee that, it would assume then that the federal government that gets its powers from the state would have to be a Republican form of government itself. But does anybody claim that that's what we have in Washington? <clears throat> does anybody make the allegation that we have a government that in fact listens to the American people? Because if we had that kind of government in Washington, I don't think we'd have Obamacare because the majority of the people, I think the numbers are now like 53% of the American people do not want Obamacare and they never have had a majority of people saying that they wanted it, yet it's on the books and it looks like it's going to be ready to uh, be there for the long run. I don't see how it's going to be taken off the books under the present administration, certainly. <clears throat> and uh, there's no way in the world it's going to even pass through the Senate to get to the president's desk if, in fact, uh, the uh, resolution could be resolved at the, um, con at the congressional level. So it's just, um, it raises a lot of questions about where we are right now with our body politic, because I don't think anybody's actually listening to the American people, quite frankly. And I hate to bring the bad news, but... I just don't get the feeling that we are in control of the republic. And we've got to uh, do a better job of holding our politicians accountable. I was watching on TV yesterday, I was watching one of the best interviews I think I've ever seen on television. And that was the one that was done by Chris Wallace on uh, Sunday morning. Uh, the program comes on Fox. I think it's called Fox Sunday Morning. And... That interview that Chris Wallace did with Jack Lou, who is the Secretary of the Treasury, was one of the classics. I don't think I've seen a better interview. And they had, for the first time, the debut of George Wills, who I forget what network he was on before he joined Fox, but that's a tremendous addition to the Fox lineup, and I think it's going to make their already runaway status as the number one cable network on on the air, I think it's going to make them even more of a formidable force out there as far as broadcast news and commentary on what is going on in the uh, in the political landscape. I don't think there's anybody going to be able to touch these guys because they are adding more and more people to the lineup, and then they are shaking the lineup up. They're sh shaking the line up. Up? Is that? Yeah, that's, that would be right, shaking the lineup up. Uh, on the uh, network tonight, for for example, we're going to have um, Greta Sirson's uh, program starts at 7, and then a rally, which is like the staple of that evening news, will stay in his position at 8 o'clock. <clears throat> but then they are going to be putting in um, Megyn Kelly at uh, 9 o'clock and then shifting Sean Handy's program back to uh, 10. This is advertising for the uh, network, I guess. We have to stop sending us some money over here at FlintTalkRadio.com. <clears throat> but um, I was just really impressed. And then, you know, and then people were sitting around as they were introducing the newcomer, George Wheels. Everyone at the table, and that was Carl Rowan, Rove, or rather, and that was um, Kirsten Powell. Uh, who else was on the uh, day? Of course, Chris Wallace was the one hosting the show. 
and um, who was the other person that they had there? They were all sitting around the table, and they were just in awe. You could tell that they were just in awe of George Wills. And I wasn't paying a lot of attention to him when he was on those other stations because he was being drowned out by all the other voices around him. But he's got a fit at uh, Fox. And when he was speaking yesterday, it was like they didn't want to take this guy's notes. He was really making some very, very profound statements. And they just sat there around the table. And when he opened his mouth up to give his viewpoint of various things, uh, which they were talking about, the interview that uh, Chris Wiles had done with Jack Lou. And they just it seemed like they just wanted to get in, almost get in this guy's mouth, and just before the words came out of his mouth, to just hear what the words were on the other side of his lips. That's how much they were seemingly um, just almost wishing uh, George Will. But I understand uh, his pedigree, and I guess that's that's what we uh, saw. But it was um, um, uh, that was a very good program. And I can't hardly wait to hear more of the commentary of George Wills. Well, I really, quite frankly, didn't pay a lot of attention to when he was on the Alphabet Soup uh, stations, uh, NBC, S ABC, CBS. I just never paid a lot of attention to him, uh, although I knew, I knew he was ringing up a different voice when I was hearing on most of those around him. But they were drowning out his voice so much, I just couldn't wait around to hear what he had to say most of the time. So I'm not really that familiar with his, his, uh, his politics. I didn't know he was a conservative. But yesterday, he really, along with the other members on that particular panel, made that program stand out. And Chris Wallace needs to be given a lot of credit for his interview of Jack Lou, who I think came there with his talking points. But Chris Wallace wasn't, wasn't hearing that. He was going around the talking points to get to the meat of the and crux of the, of the dis discussion about the government shutdown and now the next issue, the looming um, debt crisis we have, we don't do something to rein in government, or they're talking again about, believe it or not, raising the debt ceiling again. And it looks like that happens. How often does that take place? Uh, you know, it's like they, they raise, it's, it looks like they raise the debt ceiling, quite frankly, in order to buy some time so as to get to the next plateau, and then after they get to the next plateau, and we get ready to breach where the last ceiling was in fact placed, then we get ready to raise it again. I, I don't think they've ever said no to raising the debt ceiling. And uh, they're getting ready to do it again. I guess the federal government runs out of money on the uh, 17th, around the 17th of this month. And at that time, it will be up to that $16.7 trillion. I think that's, that's what the ceiling is right now. And after we reach that particular plateau, then we've got to meet again. <laughs> and raise the debt ceiling again. This is loony, uh, you know, economics. And I, I said on my, on my Facebook wall that maybe one way of dealing with the, with the debt ceiling, since you're going to raise it every time anyway, is just simply raise it to 2013 gillion. That's the year of the, uh, that we're present in. And then just put gillion on it. And, <laughs> and then <laughs> at that point, I don't think you'd ever reach, I don't even think this country's going to reach 2013 gillion. I mean, I don't know, though. I mean, it, it, <laughs> John. I have a suggestion, though. I mean, I have an idea. I mean, bring this into conversation, though. Um, it's like, uh, what if we ended the Federal Reserve? I mean, that's like in a sinister that thing. That would people don't. If we ended the Federal Reserve, we just we, we took the power to print our own money under our own hands, you know, Congress, and we basically didn't have to be charged interest on this stuff. We could expand this, but they won't change the Federal Reserve System. They won't abandon it. The Fe Federal Reserve System is we're paying a handful of private individuals interest on money we're borrowing that we're allowing them to print not it's bizarre yeah it is bizarre, it's bizarre and, thing. and if we ended the fed we could have this you know fiat cash that would actually work yes and john you know that another thing they're doing and i don't think there are many people that, under, that that know this i mean we all know about the federal reserve you know printing uh money and um uh, uh putting uh notes in treasury bills and uh putting it in the drawers IOUs, and then putting this counterfeit currency out here, that if we did that, we go to jail. <clears throat> so I think we all know about that in terms of the, of the printing mill that they have going on in Washington, where they uh, take up $2.5 trillion in taxes every year, and they borrow another $1.2 trillion from uh, taxpayers and then those around the world. <clears throat> and then on top of that, they start printing money. And I think that the, uh, the expenditures 
uh, in terms of the borrowing and the printing and the taxes amount to about four point seven to four point nine trillion dollars and they can't even live within those means and so um, now the other thing that they're doing that I don't think is, is well known is that is that they are in in, in also uh, what banks are doing and I just read about this the other day <clears throat> they are in fact um, doing digital capital right now and the way that works is that you go into the uh, banks get a loan and there's no money they're actually loaning you what they're doing is putting some on the books and out of thin air they just created capital and people are paying interest on that and you know what they're paying interest on they're paying interest on money that doesn't even exist so they got that as another part of the currency where there is in fact invisible money in the stream of the currency. Well, look at well, look at if the you know the requ uh, reserve requirements on banks have been you know last slack and you know slack you know considerably slackened over the years you know but let lowered and uh, now they don't have to have anywhere near the money that they're supposed to say their deposits are. They don't even have to have anywhere near that and still can operate. Well, that's, so right. that's a serious problem. I mean, and plus if you look at the sheer numbers, we mm -hmm. we we don't have anywhere near the money that we're you are already spending daily. That's right. It's bizarre. If people went to the banks right now and try to get their money out, I tell you right at this point that they'd have to close the banks down because after ten percent of the of the investors go in there and they put out whatever they have invested uh, in the banks, thinking the money is sitting there waiting for them to come and get it, uh, they'd have to close those banks down. That would be not only in the, in one area like in Flint, but all over the United States because that currency is not there. And it's amazing how much of the currency is being created through this digitizing, uh, this uh, uh, this digitizing of the currency, where uh, there is no currency that, that exists. They just uh, when you go in and, and get a loan from the bank, what they're doing now is uh, they're just simply uh, putting something down on the books and creating currency that's not in their hands and charging interest on what really is nothing but air, and they're paying <laughs> and. You buy your your home on a, a a bank loan, and you think that there's some money that changed hands. And what they did, the banks did, is that they in fact went to the books and just created it. And they're charging current, they're charging interest on a currency of their own creation that doesn't have any material presence. And it's just crazy what they're doing uh, with the currency in Washington. And and, and I guess they don't think we're gonna ever catch them at it. Because we're not all paying attention to what, what is happening in Washington, but we got to pay attention. They had anyway. They had on 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 Fox yesterday. They had uh, Jack Lew on 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 uh, Chris Wallace's program, and I have to tell you, I think that's one of the best interviews I've ever seen. I've seen some good ones. I think O'Reilly does a good job with his guests, and I don't think there are very many people that are his peers on uh, any of the programs. Certainly not not any of the the. Um, uh, cable networks. And I think the people agree with me on that because I look at the numbers, and when I look at uh, Fox's numbers, and uh, then look at the numbers of the other groups over there, whether it's MNBC or MSNBC and those other networks, CNN, which they got a head start a long time ago. And I look at the numbers now, and I see that um, those numbers have been taken over. It's almost like uh, they're not even watching uh, those stations from uh, 8 o'clock to uh, 11 and that's when uh, Fox begins to repeat his programs and now it's going to be 7 to 11 because they moved uh, Greta Sersen up to 7 o'clock and they rolled the other members back so they're going to be dominating now for an extra hour during the day they're already formidable and now we have this lineup that they just now um, um, uh, putting in place today as a matter of fact and they're going to be even more formidable and they said that Megan Kelly, who was on in the morning time, is now in her spurs, and she's coming to uh, prime time. And so that lineup has just gotten stronger. And George Will's over there. Uh, that is uh, that. That's just uh, a formidable uh, lineup. You know, I, I know. I, I will say this on the on QT and running. I do notice this, that ever since Dick Morris made his prediction uh, in 2012 <laughs> that that Obama's going to get slaughtered at the polls. I, mean, was a, I haven't seen Dick Morris on television since 2012. <laughs> they, ban, they banned uh, 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 Dick Morris from, uh, I guess, I don't see him. And I watch a lot of uh, Fox, and I, I just can't take some of these other networks as, in fact, taking the news. And before I, they get through with it, I can't recognize, you know, what it is they're, they're reporting on. And, and so 
<laughs> but he's he's off the air now because I guess he just went so far with board he just guaranteed this is going to happen, that's going to happen, none of it happened, and now he's out of there. But uh, this interview yesterday was was one of the best I've seen. I have to give. I almost want to write a letter, uh, send a telegram, maybe an email to uh, Chris Wallace because uh, that interview was really focused. It was a no nonsensical uh, interview, and it did not allow Jack Lou to use his talking points, which he came to the station to do. And I think if he'd known anything about how the, how the interview was going to turn out, I don't think it would have shown up because Chris Wallace took him to school. Uh, what, they, what they were talking about primarily is um, this Chicken Little story that continues to be, re be told and continues to reverberate in Washington that the sky is going to fall unless the Republican Party caves in. You know, they told us uh, that the sky was going to fall and catastrophe is going to be everywhere and we were going to have another economic Armageddon on our hand, just like in 1929, if we didn't do something about uh, putting a budget in place to allow the government, in fact, not to be shut down. And lo and behold, the two sides couldn't agree because the Republican Party insisted on sending bills to the Senate, just like little children playing, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, dodgeball or something. You put the ball over here, they put it over there. And, um, what is checkers or something? Uh, this is government. And what they were doing up there in Washington was the Republicans would send a bill to the Senate. The Senate would send it back. They would change the bill and send back the other this the next bill. They wouldn't have what the Senate wanted in it, and they would send that back. And finally, Reed told them that. If you send any bill over here for appropriations that doesn't have Obamacare in it, it's dead on arrival. And so the, it, it broke down, and, and lo and behold, we had what they call a government shutdown, and we're still here. I, I had said on my Facebook wall that we should not, in fact, panic, which is what they try to do. You know, if you panic, then you push your representatives to uh, cut a deal because you're fighting by all of the um, um, Armageddon stories coming out of Washington, you know, the chicken little stories, the sky is going to fall on our head. And the idea was to push the people up, get them so panicked that they would, in fact, call the representatives and put pressure on them to make a deal. And then they come in with the tails between their legs. And before you know it, we have a, a budget that does even worse things than the budget we already have in place is, uh, is doing. And this Obamacare, which, they, which the Republicans were holding out for, is a train wreck. And we know that from the fact that we have, right now, I'm talking about the effects of it at this point, and these are the peripheral effects. It hasn't, hasn't even kicked in until the full effects, uh, full, the full effects won't kick in until January of 2014. And even then it won't kick in for everybody because the exemptions have been given by some of the uh, Democrats' Uh, friends who have been exempted from it, like Labor, for example, and they've exempted themselves from the effects of it <clears throat> and given themselves a subsidy, and a number of other things that have gone on. So it won't fully affect all of the, of the people because it's not being evenly applied. But for most of us, we're going to have to reconcile the um, economics of our own households with the economics of the mandates and the Obamacare starting in January of next year. And it's not going to go good because we see some of the things that's happening right now, and these are the edges of the policies being put in place uh, next year. And we see that this is devastating. We can imagine when we go full force with the operation in its totality, what it's going to look like at uh, that point. It's not going to go good, and it's not going well now. <clears throat> they had one person on on um, on television. I think this must have been on the Hannity Show last Friday, and <clears throat> she was on a computer. And the idea was we're going to live, we're going to go on, on, online and try to enroll in Obamacare and see if we can get through the glitches and, and in fact do that. And 30 minutes later, the lady that's online still trying to get on there to do that. And by the end of the show, it went off and no luck. Come back tomorrow and try again. 
uh, that kind of thing. It's trying to, we're trying to show how much of the system is not in place right now, and the country would, would have been better served if they had taken the Republican Party up on his word <clears throat> on this uh, proposal to, in fact, postpone Obamacare until next year when we have a lot of other things ironed out that's not ironed out right now. And we would also be able to get the glitches out of the system, all of those glitches that are in right now that are bottlenecks and keeping people from doing that which they may want to do as far as signing up for Obamacare. <clears throat> they can't do that because the system is broken. And it would also allow for us to have enough data collected to find out what are the true effects of the bill because one side is saying one thing and the other side is saying another thing. So we, we have to have some idea what the true, uh, what the facts are and what needs to be reconciled so we can have a bill that would not be injurious as this bill seems to be. And it, it does not seem like that it has any components in it that are positive, quite frankly. I'm seeing all kinds of things that are happening. Uh, uh, what doctors are saying and uh, what the carriers are saying and the effects upon them, what business persons are saying, what the employees are, are saying about the effects it has on their particular um, household income. It, I, I just don't, I don't hear any, any good stories. And it just is really amazing that what I thought was a, what I, what I think most American people would have thought was a fairly reasonable proposal, let's fund the government, let's postpone Obamacare for another year as we begin to try to get the data to find out in what direction we need to go. If we need to change, we need to change the thing, then uh, these are the changes that need to be made over here, maybe some over there, and have a bill that is in fact, which is flawed, but have it better than it is right now. I thought there was a proposal we could, we could live with. And each time they send it over there with different changes in it, uh, but Obamacare not being funded by the uh, by the House, uh, it was dead on arrival in the Senate. And they were saying, was something I had never heard before, and I, I tried to go and look at history in terms of have we ever had this before in the history of the United States. I, don't, I, I couldn't find, and I don't think it exists, where we've had a president of the United States to say, uh, uh, beforehand, not that the bill was going to reach his desk in the first place, but he is the head of the Democratic Party, and for him to say uh, 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 beforehand that he is not going to negotiate and the bill must be kept as it is in fact uh, uh, written and they would not negotiate any kinds of things inside of the bill. <clears throat> so we didn't have a budget. And when this, the clock struck 12.01, you know, on the first of this month, then that meant that the country uh, did not have the kind of finance to remain open. But I was saying something else about what we call a shutdown, because quite frankly, um, you can't, sh you know, you really can't shut the government down. I don't know, what does that mean? You know, we have to define terms. Uh, the government, and I'm talking about what's called for here in the Constitution. This is uh, the document that runs the, or I should say should, uh, be the, uh, the operative around which the nation uh, revolves. It's not that, but it should be. It was intended to be by the framers. And this document that was put in place by these brilliant, Men, no women were there, but um, it would have been interesting if they had been there. Probably would have been a better document, even, even more so than it is, but it is a good document in and of itself. And that is this Constitution that calls for what the government will, uh, will be and what it looks like. And what it calls for is three different branches of government. In Article 1, the legislative branch. Article 2, the executive branch. And then the third article sets up our judicial uh, system, our federal judicial system. <clears throat> and that is our government. And if anybody saw any of those branches shut down, then you saw what I didn't see. Because I didn't see any of them shut down. I saw the uh, judicial branch still meeting, the nine members of the Supreme Court. I saw the members of Congress. They were still there. And that was President Obama. 
and his administration was still operating. So what was his government sh uh, shutdown? Uh, I use another word for it, um, which they're not going to use this, this term because they want us to believe that, you know, chicken little, uh, you know, the story is, is true and the sky is falling and we got, need to go out there and warn people that the, the collapse is imminent and uh, we are, it's inevitable that we're going to have this collapse. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, is that uh, when it, uh, what, what it came down to is that they began to uh, lay off what amounted to uh, the bureaucracy. And it was really interesting the words that they used. They said that the bureaucracy, they didn't use the word bureaucracy, they said they're going to um, uh, lay off people, they call them furloughs, going to give furloughs uh, to people uh, whom they designated as non-essential federal employees. Now, you would think then, okay, there are 2.1 million employees the federal government uh, hires and has employed. So uh, how many of them are non-essential? You would not think the numbers would be, would be great. You would think that the government has on the uh, dockets because of their respect for taxpayers. Uh, you know, that's a wink-wink on that one. <clears throat> but, but out of their respect for the taxpayers, that they're not going to overburden the taxpayers who are doing all they can to make the, their own financial ends meet and need to have their money to, in fact, raise their children, send the children to school, pay for the college, the school clothes, things of that sort, the books. And uh, you would think then, out of respect for the taxpayers, you're not going to overburden the uh, federal government with employees that, that you don't need. So when you talk about laying off non-essential workers, uh, federal workers, you were, you were thinking about some small numbers, but that was not what, what played out. <clears throat> the way it played out, and this is very eye-opening, and I hope the American people were paying attention to it because it was very revealing. Uh, they said that the non-essential employees total upwards of 800,000 people. Now, the federal government employs 2.1 million persons. So almost, what they're saying then is almost, it's almost like 40%, but I'm going to say that it's almost half of the employees, the federal employees that were considered non-essential, which well, that is quite a statement about a number of things. One is a, a certain amount of disrespect for the uh, taxpayers who you, you would think the government would be involved in trying to lighten the burden as much as they can by not putting weight on there that's beyond that which is needed to make the federal government operational. But that's not what we saw. We saw 800,000, according to one count, of non-essential workers being uh, laid off. And, and, and they didn't call it layoff, they call it furloughs. <clears throat> uh, and, and that's another thing we have to look at. And that is the furlough has to do with the fact that for example, when you leave out the army, you get a furlough. That means you're coming back. <clears throat> you're just like on vacation. So they, what they're really saying is that uh, they're on a, um, a induced, a federal government induced vacation. They're not laid off. Uh, all the money that is being, um, that's not being paid, and they're not lost a check yet because we, you know, get paid every two weeks in federal government like you do in the uh, other uh, jobs. So they're not lost one, one penny. But if it lasts as long as it did in uh, 1995, 1996, when we had a government shutdown, quote unquote, I put the word shutdown in all kinds of quotes. <clears throat> when you have a government shutdown uh, like you did in 1995 and 1996 on the Clinton, then uh, what happens is that if it lasts as it did then for three weeks, that they get their back pay once they begin to give them their checks again. So they're not going to lose any money. They're going to, uh, they're not, there they might be a delay in it, but they're not going to uh, lose any of the income that uh, they would have uh, had if the uh, shutdown had not occurred. So we need not even worry, worry about that aspect. But what we had here was not a shutdown. Because nothing actually was, was shut down, except we did see some of the bureaucracy that exceeds what is needed. We saw that, in fact, laid off. And even if you laid it off at that point, what it really means is that 
and I want to look, look at these numbers. It, it means that you had 1.3 million uh, workers still on board in the federal government. Now, let me tell you what that number would, would have to do, have, what, what compares to that number. Let's take uh, the, the largest employer in the United States. And that employer is Wal, uh, Walmart. Uh, Walmart employs 2.2 million employees. There are 2.2 million employees that Walmart uh, employs. Now, of that number, 900,000 of them are employed outside the United States. And that means then that Walmart employs 1.3 million employees throughout the 50 states of the United States. All 50 states, they have 1.3 million employees working inside of the contiguous and non-contiguous parts of the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, the non-contiguous states. The government, federal government, pretty much sits and situates itself in Washington. There are other aspects of it outside of the uh, belt. They do have federal judges and things of that sort, uh, the Federal Reserve System. Um, there, there are certain residual parts of it elsewhere, <clears throat> FBI offices and things like that, but most of it is situated in in one one place. The body of it is in one place. The major parts of it is uh, there. The RES, Cincinnati, you have some of those branches. But um, of all the all, but all the the, con the constituent parts, total 1.3 million quote essential employees which matches the employees in the private sector uh, working for Walmart. And when I looked at those numbers, quite frankly, I was it was quite interesting looking, just kind of, you know, I like to play with numbers. Let's play with these numbers just to see what those numbers look like in terms of, okay, take this out and see what that would be. And when I, when I took out the employees of, um, of, uh, of, of Walmart, in, which is the uh, 900,000, then it made the federal government the largest employee uh, in the country, and even if you added in the 900,000 employees of Walmart and then take them out, the federal government would still be 100,000 uh, uh, employees uh, higher than what is working in Walmart because they have 2.1 um, million. No, what would happen is that Walmart would be 100,000 more than the uh, United States, but. It, uh, it only about 100,000 persons would it be larger and we're talking about the private sector here where no tax money no income tax money goes to pay for Walmart's operation that's in the private sector and they are only 100,000 persons in totality all over the world larger than the, the monstrosity we've created in Washington, D.C. is never intended to be. <clears throat> That's why this document right here needs to be looked at in terms of what was, in fact, the view of those who set this up in terms of them uh, believing that they had restrained government and they restrained it by num part of its size, part of it is restrained by its size. And the other thing is restrained by is the fact that it does not have all this power that's been given to it because enumeration of powers in Article 1, Section 8, it very specifically itemized the eight, the 17 things that can be done by the federal government, with the 18th being the, um, the, the clause that allows to carry out those 17 responsibilities. So in Article 1, the 18 clauses, the 18 clause is just an empowerment clause to carry out the 17 particulars that are laid out in Article 1, Section 8. And yet what we have here is this monstrosity that was never intended by the framers. We have to also, uh, after you get past the idea of the shutdown, and, was, and really what it is, I was, I was, I was saying that uh, it's not really a shutdown because neither branch of government, as you can see, was shut down. What you had was you had a, what, what's called, what would have been called in business, uh, downsizing. Because when you downsize, what you do is that your numbers are not that which would support a much larger operation. So what you do 
is that you, in fact, downsize. And you don't call it shutdown. Why? Because a company still opens its doors up from 9 to 5. That doesn't change. And if it stays open to 9, okay, 9 to 9. That, that doesn't change. What it did was downsize. So ask yourself this question then. Why would the government, knowing that it is mandated by the Constitution, I mean, in fact, they're not even going to lose a paycheck. People are saying, well, well the, the congressmen, they're not losing any of their money. They can't because of the 27th Amendment. Let me read that one to you. They're not going to lose any money. They, they might do some, what some of them are doing right now, uh, grandstanding in, in Washington by saying that we're not going to receive our salary. Uh, guess, uh, don't forget the caveat here. We're not going to receive our salary as long as the government is shut down. Now, what they're doing is putting their checks over here in escrow. They're not saying that because uh, Congress is not really doing its job that they forgo the salary they are, that they are promised to uh, receive. That's not going to happen. <clears throat> but they're not going to lose any money because here's what the, here's what the Constitution uh, says. It says in Amendment 27, 27, it says, No law varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. And that was put in there uh, basically because we don't want these uh, members of the Senate and the members of the House raising their salary uh, before going before the voters. And so if they do it, then before it can take, take place, uh, then uh, they have to go and face the wrath of the voters first before that kicks in. No law varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall, shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. And notice it says here, until election of the representatives has, have, has intervened, uh, because... Between passing it and going before the voters, in between that breach, before that law can kick in, and here's a law in there between passing it and the actual receipt of the money, in between that is the election got to be held because we want to see if, if these persons that did that can withstand the wrath of the voters, like another part of the check and balance system, and if they dare do that, then here is a potential consequence is we're restraining them for, from doing things that are excessive as far as their pay scale is concerned. But when they say they're not going to take their pay, let's understand what they're doing. There's a lot of grandstanding that they're doing where they're saying that they'll uh, hold off in fact in receiving it until the uh, government is no longer shut down and all the checks they didn't receive. You just send those checks uh, on a regular to get all the checks caught up. And uh, in fact, they're going to be printed anyway and just simply have to send them to them. But they are going to get their money, and it's because the Constitution uh, uh, mandates it. And number one, they're going to require it. I mean, did anyone see uh, last week where they were talking about how many of the persons in the, in the Congress are uh, millionaires? Um, about half of them are, and there are 535 members of the Congress. So just divide that by two, and you get the number of persons that are millionaires in the, in the congressional body. And then. Those that are not millionaires, I think that they're that they're uh, uh, suffering and uh, and they're not uh, doing well because the average uh, salary, I, I should say, the average uh, income that's been accumulated by the members of Congress is nine hundred and I would say forty four thousand to nine hundred and sixty four thousand uh, dollars. That is a medium income not income, the medium amount of bank that, uh, they, that uh, the members of, of, of uh, Congress have. So even those that are not uh, millionaires, they're not that far down now on the scale. So these are either some very smart people or we're not that smart out here. Now, either, we got, either, either the people in Congress are smarter than we are by far in my own case, it's like, well, I many times would I be smarter than I am given the income differential between my income and theirs? But if they're the smart people on the planet, uh, we're not as bright as we think that we are. And a lot of, a lot of people that I come in contact with, you know, we, th we, we don't think we are, we are we're dumbbells, but we don't have that kind of income. 
And that's after working all these years and still haven't accumulated it. But uh, you go into Congress, all of a sudden you, some light bulb turns on, you get smarter, you go out there and you know how to play the stock market, the money starts rolling in, you're not doing anything under the table, and you're making all, all, that, all that wealth. So that, that, that's, that's quite, quite, quite amazing. But we got to get back to the accountability factor that was intended by the framers. And what they did was put in, and it's amazing to me to look at the Constitution, and just every time I read it, I read something different into it. And I just have to say, wow, I'm just in awe of what they were able to do there. But they had several different ways of, in fact, trying to hold the government down because they feared what is happening right now in the body politic. They, they kind of saw what was possible as far as the government getting off its murders, and they tried to prevent that from taking place. Now, in terms of sending this bill back to the, to the House of Representatives, which uh, uh, Reed not going to let anything pass and go through there, so we can forget that. If it doesn't have Obamacare in it, they can forget it. But you know, I'll tell you what the Republican Party did, and some of the things they've done I have really been impressed with, and that was, okay, you won't pass anything that goes in there, goes over to the Senate that doesn't have Obamacare in it. Okay, fine. Let's send over this veterans bill. Uh, similarly, now I'll tell you what we do. We'll send over this bill that asks for pay for the military. Now, let me, let me see some uh, senator, some member of the House, <laughs> say that our soldiers, and that includes those that serve this country, uh, I, it, I'm talking about those who served in, in World War II, they went to see their own monument in Washington. I want to see somebody uh, tell me <clears throat> that you, I, in fact, I, I moved to the state where this person would be just to vote against him. You tell me that a person putting his life on the line for the country and he is risking his life on a daily basis to defend all the ones who are here in these ivory tower offices, tower offices, and they're not going to pay them. I wish, I, I wish a, a member of the House and Senate had dared say that. But you know, what, you know what surprises me? That Obama has got so much contempt for everybody in the United States that doesn't agree with him. And he's just so arrogant to see that he is supposed to be a servant of the people. He just, he just, he, he wants to recreate the whole world in his image. I mean, that's, that's, I, and he won't even take any kind of, you know, protest or any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of uh, people who say anything against it. He just overrides it. He thinks he's so, I mean, I've never seen anybody in the public square at that level so outwardly and so non-covertly arrogant like him. Uh, you, you said it, you said it exactly right. I, I don't think we've ever seen a thing like this president before who is uh, thin-skinned, and I think very insecure, <clears throat> because you don't have a person that is comfortable in his own skin and uh, knows who he is or she is and have this kind of insecurity where they have to have total agreement. That's a dictator. And dictators uh, require around them sycophants because their power is always um, at risk because they don't have a mandate. But this president was elected, so that would take that particular part of his um, uh, of, of his psyche away from that arena. But yeah, we see a lot of that insecurity still in place here. And that pres you're right, the president uh, almost um, he almost has to have uh, persons applauding uh, what, what it is that he's doing. And I see him go out there talking to these people that are the the low. Um, information voters. He's telling them all kinds of ridiculous things. They're up there applauding. <laughs> People up there applauding all this nonsense. I wish I was in the audience. I you, you hear a couple of, you know, boo. I, you, a lot of, me, I, they wouldn't let me sit on the stage very long because I'd be kind of mouthing. So I wouldn't get up there clapping. You, you can believe that. Yeah, and other thing is, <laughs> if you just look at the press, I mean, surrounding, they have dropped any kind of pretense for oh. being unbiased and trying to be fair and uh, accurate and uh, balanced. They're they're all, they're coming they're coming on hinge. I mean, Chris Matthews and these guys are just. I don't see how they should be stripped of their journalistic credentials. Uh, really, John, I, I don't even consider them to be journalists anymore because they're, uh, they're, I, they're, I, got, I got an image of Chris Matthews wearing a cheerleaders all the <laughs> Well, he's already admitted he's got a crush on him. Yeah, the I mean, after the game. Yeah, what about that chill? What was that? Threw up his leg. You know, when the president talks, uh, he has a, 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 a chill up his legs. Uh, these guys need some pom poms. 
You know, I, I just, I, you know, I'm just waiting for uh, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell. You know, really, all of the ones over there at MSNBC, and some of the ones over there on CNN, they lost their their uh, minds. Uh, one one guy, interestingly enough, one guy asked a question as the president was leaving from his uh, uh, press conference. He didn't take any questions because you know you can't read, you can't put the uh, question teleprompter and didn't read the answer underneath it because you know what they may ask. So he didn't like to take a lot of questions. Anyway, when he had this last uh, press conference, which was telling us basically the Republicans are wrong for not agreeing with me. Uh, one guy from NBC, as the president was leaving the uh, podium, hollered at him, Mr. President, do you think that you're responsible for any things that's going on here? And you would think that guy would have got on the air from NBC and said that the president should take some responsibility. No, you know what he, what he did after he got through asking the question? We don't went to the air and, and blamed the Republicans for the shutdown. <laughs> You're talking about Kool-Aid. This guy, I mean, the, anybody, every book I've read <laughs> on leadership, so even, except some partial blame, even if you had nothing to do with the right. events, they led up to a bad That's event. what that book stops here is about. And, and, but, but he's like, I mean, this guy who's like made a career out of blaming everybody else around him. Well, if he didn't, wasn't aware that he was going to inherit a situation from his predecessor, then he should never ran for office. Because that's the, that's the reality of being president. Everybody inherits a situation from the predecessor. Of course. And nobody inherits uh, paradise. Uh, John, for four years, Obama was making policy. It was never his fault. Bush left office. Now, let me get this straight. <laughs> Bush left office on the 20th. Uh, folks, are you with me out there on this one? Uh, let's go back and get our count down. Bush left office on the 20th of January. You went so far, 2009. Now, count the years up. Let's go together here. 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. That's four years later. We're ready for the next election now. But everything that happened between 2009 and 2012 was Bush's fault. And that guy refused to leave. Now, he's down there in Texas. He's like, got a ranch down there. He didn't want to go, go there. He wanted to stay in the Oval Office, and we couldn't see him. <laughs> and that guy ran that narrative for four years. And now that it's not Bush's fault anymore, because he got, he got one year, four years of his own administration, it's now all the Republicans' fault. First of all, it's one man's fault. Now, the 200, and let me see now, there are 234. Four, I believe, don't quote me on this one, uh, members of the House that are Republicans, and I think there are six more Democrats in the Senate than there are Republicans, so you can figure the math out there. <clears throat> uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, take the Senate back, uh, the Republicans, I'm saying we, uh, we got to get the Democrats out of there and then get a president that we can re rescind this bill, that's what's got to happen, I, not that I'm a Republican, I'm an independent. But I'd like to know who the Republicans are going to run, because I mean, I... I liked Ron Paul, but Rand Paul, I have issues with. I think he's kind of a snake in the grass. Mm -hmm. I don't fully trust him. I don't trust him. And um, Ted Cruz, uh, if he was born in Canada, he, I don't know if he was born to American parents. That's gonna re he's, he's not going to be eligible to run if they make hay out of that. They're going to because they've, everybody else made hay about you know Obama's you know the place of birth. So I don't know who they're going to run. I mean, the Republicans are kind of lacking anybody to offer up. Well, if they don't stop, um, I, well, well, first of all, uh, Cruz is eligible, John. Uh, he had dual citizenship. He renounced his Canadian citizenship because he does want to position himself to run in 2016. He does have ambition. I The reason why I kind of um, look askance at him now, although I think his voice is one that stands outside of the uh, norm from what we've been getting from these, these um, Republicans. Uh, these, uh, I call them in my article this past week on, on, on Facebook, these uh, neighbor Chamberlains, you know, the, the, the party of... <laughs> The Republican Party is a party of Neville Chamberlain today. But he does stand out a little bit from the rest of the crowd, although I really was kind of, you know, not really happy with him standing up there grandstanding in the Senate as he did, knowing that uh, the, the Senate had no role in that because of Article 1, Section uh, 7. And there's nothing. When you have these impasses like you have right now, you, th there's no role for the Senate to play because they don't, uh, have a role in setting the purse strings. Right now, it's about who, you know, who's the daddy here, and the Senate is not the daddy because the Senate doesn't actually initiate a funding stream. Let me let me read this to you, where, where we can all be on the same page with that, because I think we're going to be doing over the next um, several uh, 
excuse me, several, several programs is going over the Constitution, making sure we understand it. Because I think we understand this document right here, we can kind of um, do what we did this, this, this last week, which really has been quite refreshing to see some of us opening our eyes up and raising a question about what are they doing up there in Washington. But here's what Article 1, Section uh, 7 says. All bills for raising revenue shall, not should, shall originate in the House of Representatives. And it's got a but there after putting the semicolon there. It says, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. So what that means is it starts in the House. They sit over there for, for Reed to say no to. <laughs> then Reed can send it back with whatever proposal he wants to put on there, but he cannot initiate it. All the spending that goes on in the country goes on in the Republican in the Republican House right now, and that's a good thing because when they had both the House and the Senate and the President, we got Obamacare. And how's that working out for anybody? There's the um, the, the country is now imploding in on his head. And John, you were talking about the bias in the media. Let, let me show. Let me let me share this with you. You haven't seen this, right? Uh, we haven't seen this. Uh, we didn't talk about this before. We were on the air, but Time Magazine. It comes out. I get it. Uh, I get it at my at my home on Saturday. So when it came out this for this, for this coming uh, week, they have here in the issue dated October the fourteenth. John, look at this right here. They got majority rule, and then they got got majority rule crossed out. In other words, what what Time Magazine is saying is that you Republicans, we had an election in two thousand and twelve, and you lost. We had an election in two thousand and um, and and nine, and and Barack Obama became president. In 2010, in uh, February uh, the 21st, 2010, we passed the Obama Act by majority rule, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And here's what you're doing to it: they got to cancel out majority rule is cancel out, meaning that the, the Republican Party refuses to be a democratically uh, orientated uh, group. They want to take away. Uh, democracy in the United States. How about the people <laughs> vote? I mean, fifty-seven percent of the population they read, I read <laughs> disagrees with Obamacare. They have issues with it. Well, I was that saying that's the majority of the country, but these yahoos in office <laughs> decide that they're going to push it down our throats, despite our protests, despite our issues, despite our concerns. They haven't addressed them. I mean, Nancy Pelosi so blithely says, you got to pass it before you see what's in it. <laughs> it's not a grab bag, Nancy. Okay, I mean, we're going to have to live with this for decades or millennia, whatever. It, 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 it was so stupid about it. <laughs> they won't leave, the, the idea is they won't leave Obamacare alone yet a majority pass. And what's wrong with these guys? Okay, what's wrong with uh, you uh, with the Second Amendment? We got that in the Constitution. And they won't, and they won't um, abide by it. They keep on attacking it. Well, look at the First Amendment now. They're going to, uh, Dianne Feinstein wants to set laws in place so that they can determine who's considered a journalist. Of course, it's going to be everybody who licks their hand and cuddles, cuddles up to them. Uh, I mean, the watchdogs who are supposed to be watching these yutzes are now going to be hand-selected by the yutzes. I, mean, I guarantee you that when that happens, uh, when we have the... The Democrats doing all the things they're doing in terms of uh, not only uh, uh, talking, uh, challenging uh, majority rule, but they're challenging the Constitution. I bet you won't see Time Magazine put on there anything saying uh, the Constitution rules and then putting there some lines because of what the Democrats are doing. This is just another indication of where the press is. It's a biased uh, uh, party, and uh, really they're part of the Democratic Party, an extension of it, because all they do is, is, is give the Democratic parties. Uh, gives the Democratic Party talking points. And that's just what they do. That's the role they play. And, and anything that comes out of their mouth, you, have to, you know, take it with a grain of sand, maybe an ocean of sand. Because we're not getting any news there. All we're getting is propaganda. I would like to see them up there on that stage with J.J. Carney when Jay Carney uh, is is uh, doing doing the press conferences. They'll just go up there on the stage. <laughs> they should sit out there always asking Jay Carney any questions. They should go up there and put seats on that stage up there. <laughs> And then, and then he starts talking, just start clapping. Because those are the points that you're going to be uh, running with after he finishes. You're going to have all the talking points that, he, that he's laying out there. I don't know why they want to sit out there in the audience as if they're independent from that. Well, 
I, I, I want to go back to what I said I, I talked about at the beginning of the hour. Um, because that was that interview, you have to, it's, it's online, by the way, because I, I was, uh, I, I put it on, on my Facebook wall before I left coming to the studio. And that, that uh, interview is, uh, is on YouTube. It is 16 minutes long, and it is one of the greatest interviews, I think, that they've ever had on television. Uh, Jack Lew was trying his best to get around to say the Republican Party uh, won't budge. And Mike, uh, I keep saying Mike Wallace because that was his dad who was a great journalist in his own right. Um, very astute in terms of his observations. I think that's where Chris got his genes from. <clears throat> um, but anyway, Chris Wallace would not let him get away with anything. Every time Lou would go over these talking points, which I think he had memorized, there was Chris Wallace saying, in fact, what, and what, <laughs> and what has changed uh, Jack Lou said, told um, uh, Chris Wallace, who had done his homework, by the way, that uh, your history is wrong. This is what Jack Lou told Chris Wallace. Chris Wallace came back and told him, and what they were arguing about, by the way, was uh, over whether or not any other president ever said, I'm not, not going to negotiate. And what Chris Wallace said, no, your history is wrong. He said, he said uh, with due respect, uh, I, you know, you always try to say, I, I would say, with no respect. But you have to say that, I guess I'm telling you, say, uh, I do respect because of his office. And I will respect the office, but I will tell the person, look, that's the office, not, not you. Put, that, put, put that, that pen over here where I can talk to you directly without talking to the office. That, that pen says you're Secretary of State. Put that down, let me talk directly to you. But he said, uh, uh, the, what, he, what he said was that out of due, with due respect, your history is wrong, and he told him that what they say is not the not, it's not unprecedented for the um, Republican Party to challenge this president. What is uh, unprecedented is for this president to say out of hand that no matter what the other side does, that it is it is either his way or the highway. And folks, I'm a historian. I'll tell you this: I look, I went back through all my books that I thought. Could give me some information about how other presidents have acted in the role that Obama's now are uh, in. And I'll be honest with you, I look two days, really. I mean, not all day. I had to stop for dinner <laughs> and go out for breakfast. But I, but I did take a lot of time going through to see, is there any other case where we've had someone to say, in essence, that it is going to be this way and nothing else is going to be under consideration for even being, um, even taken as a serious proposal. Is this proposal right here? And that is a done deal. And if Donald Griffith, the government stays uh, shut down, and the president was saying that he thought he was winning. Well, that was at, at the beginning as MSNBC, Jack Lou, and others are out there doing the talking points. Jay kind of doing his usual propaganda. But those, that, that table has been turned right now. And I think it began to turn because of the way they treat those veterans up there who went there to um, uh, have a chance to look at, and these are spring chickens, to look at their memorial. They're the ones that is being honored by that memorial. And they're being told, and they were told that they could not go there to see a memorial, that they, in fact, uh, had. Um, uh, that was honoring what they had done in places like Normandy. I'm glad they went through those uh, walls. And Margaret Levine, I want to give you some, some credit because I, I was going to join you in Washington. Margaret Levine said last week that they put their hands on a single one of those veterans. Margaret Levine said, I'll bring 500,000 people to Washington. You would have thought this was a march on Washington. I would have been there if I had to walk. <laughs> and so that, that would have happened. Well, Chris Wallace, want to give you a, a, a shout out. The veterans go in and see your memorial. If they put um, chains on it, bring chain cutters. They are not going to stop you because if they did. They would outrage the the whole uh, world uh, uh, with, with that. We're going to stay. We're going to stay on this um, case 
because we want to see how this is going to end up. And I want to tell those Republicans out there, uh, some of you getting weak out there, I'm looking at you and what you're talking about. You need to stay the course because we need to, we need to rein this government in. Okay, we'll be back next week with another edition of the uh, program called What's Going On. Until then, I want you to stay tuned to all the programs here on FlintTalkRadio.com. And don't forget to follow your dream because if you don't follow your dream, you will never know what's on the other side of the rainbow. <laughs>